The late rapper, singer and producer Ricardo Ricky Rick Mercado took his life in February this year. The passing of the iconic hitmaker sent shockwaves across the music industry and left his family, his friends and fans devastated. On the six-month anniversary of the tragic event, I visited the family at their Midrand home and sat down for an intimate conversation, checking in on how life has been and how they have been making sense of losing him. Yesterday was a very important milestone for the family, it's six months now yeah. since Ricky's passing. Um, I can only imagine, you know, the struggle that comes with moving on with life and building new routines. How, how are you coping? Um, I think every day, every day is different. And I, some, yeah, some days are easier than, than others. And um, I just get up in the morning and especially when the kids are at school, you know, there's more of a routine for me because I have no choice but to get up and go. Um, and I cope with just having an amazing support structure around me. And also the kids give me a lot of strength, you know. Um, and the days that I'm not okay, I allow myself not to be okay. That's, I think, a really important thing in the grieving and in the mourning process is allowing yourself that opportunity to be vulnerable. Yeah. And to feel everything. Yeah. What are some of the ways you get through that moment? Keeping to myself. Um, I feel like I withdraw and it's my way of coping. And just giving me time to like process, you know, whatever I'm feeling. Um, I do know I've been going through phases of different emotions. Um, and just basically allowing myself to go through it and um, keeping to myself and processing it in my own way. And I think also I pray a lot and that helps me, helps me get through, you know, the days where it is tough. In circumstances like this, you also think about the children. You know, you think about Mike, you think about Jordan. How do you deal with questions? Around, around Ricky, around their dad? Um, I've been very open from the, from the get-go, from the first day, um, about what happened to dad. Um, and with the kids, I speak a lot. Um, I listen a lot. And I think they are now comfortable in expressing themselves and they're both processing in their own ways. Um, and they know if they have any questions that around that, they are able to come and, you know, ask and talk about it. Um, and I think they both are there. Um, so it's just about, it's just about me being honest, you know? Um, and there hasn't been too many questions because, um, we've been honest from the beginning. It's really tough when you have kids, you know, to navigate losses like these. Are there particular themes you know, that you find it hard to discuss with them? The difficult, for me, it's always the first. So Father's Day, um, Ricky's birthday. Um, so like important days, you know, and um, Jordan's been I think she's older, so she's processing very differently to Mike. Um, and she knows she's able to come just to talk and have a cry. And um, with him, um, he, he, he comes over when he's sad, he expresses why he's sad. If he's had a bad dream and it's involved dad, you know, he expresses that. And a lot of the times it is a little cry. Um, and I just listen just listen and sometimes cry with him, you know, uh, or cry with both of them. And um, yeah, that's how I'm handling it. In situations like these, Bianca, as time passes and we, we mark the six month milestone, you always think in hindsight, I mean, were there some signs? Were there things that I, that I missed that I, I ought to have picked up that were signs that something bad was coming? As you reflect, d does that happen to you? I think, Naturally, you do feel guilty, you know, that you could have done more. Um, you should have picked up on more. Um, but um, 
yeah, I think, I don't want to say that there were signs because I never, I never thought it would have gone that way. Um, but I do know Ricky was struggling and it's, it's, you know, it's not just in a year or recent years. I, I feel from the time that we met, there was always um, like struggles, you know. So, um, yeah, I just, I didn't think that it would go, it would happen this way. It's tough when you, when you have a partner who is dealing with depression over long periods of time or dealing with different types of anxieties. You do get into, as you say, a sort of pattern of being able to relate without thinking something really, really bad would happen. What kinds of support would you say were in those moments for him to, to, to be able to, to get through? Um, I would say I was a support. We spoke a lot and we spoke about almost everything and it might not have been in that moment, but, you know, a few days later, if there was something that was he was struggling with, um, we would talk and, um, and, and, and Mama as well was a huge support to him. Kumi was a huge support to him. His siblings were a huge support to him. Um, but when it came to, you know, having to get, I think, uh, professional help. He was always a little bit hesitant, and I would say that would be in the last year or so, um, because he thought he'd be able to deal with it on his own. Um, yeah, it's hard because I can't, I, I can't speak f for him, but it's on, it's, it's what I've, you know, what I picked up, and but I do know that he would have a lot of moments where he would just speak to, you know, mom, Kumi the boys, myself. So I guess that those are the, his ways of, of, of coping. You know, Bianca, listening to you relate about Ricky and this beautiful sort of soul craft that you did together, this so, you know, this, this sharing of how connected the two of you were. And then you look at the nastiness of social media. You look at the impressions that the public have of you. There was a particular video that a lot of people had things to say about you coming across as cold or as, as disconnected. I, I'm, I'm wondering for you how much that pained you, you know, to hear that or to be depicted in that way and people making these sorts of assumptions about you. Yeah, it's always, I think it's always pained me. I just, it's pained me because people feel um, so entitled um, and by nature I'm a shy person and private as well um, and when Ricky would bring me into these things um, he knew that I'd you know I'd be shy but because of the love and the joy that we were experiencing in that moment um, you know he would he would bring me in um, but I think it pains that people assume that um, I'm miserable because those are some of the comments that I'm miserable or, you know, they're going through a hard time or whatever, you know, whatever the assumptions were. Um, and I know that did, you know, it did frustrate him. Um, so how do you stand your ground now? I think I've always tried not to just not to pay too much of attention. Um, and that's the only way and, and kind of block myself out from knowing what people are saying. But I would feel it through, you know, his frustrations of reading comments or, yeah. And when you reflect on your last conversation with Ricky, are you comfortable sharing what that was like and what you talked about and what his last words to you were? Sure, we had, the Sunday before, we had like a five hour conversation and the most beautiful conversation about everything. You know, just life, um, us, um, kids, the way he was feeling. Um, it was just, um, you know, just everything. Um, and I think that conversation also gave me a lot of, um, a lot has given me a lot of peace. Um, because any questions or doubts, you know, were were spoken about and um, in that conversation. Um, and I did speak to Ricky like, you know, to like early parts of that morning as well, but not at any point did I, um, 
think or, or, or feel, because his last words were um, in that conversation, I'm on my way home um, and love you. So when I woke up two hours later and figured that he wasn't back home, um, you know, that's, I didn't get concerned right at that moment because sometimes studio, um, if he's in studio, he would stay on late. Um, but yeah, when I couldn't get hold of him after dropping the kids, I had to go straight to the, to check up on him. When you see those words beyond the literal, I'm on my way home, mm -hmm. what does that mean to you now? I feel like it makes so much of sense. I think, you know, even, even a day after, I, just reading that made and his last tweet, it just made so much of sense that um, he was basically saying he's on his way home. You have made quite a, quite a bold and quite a personal tribute to Ricky with body art. Yeah. Do you want to just share that with us, sure. if you're comfortable? <laughs> <laughs> that is it. It's such a beautiful piece. It is. What is that is. moment, that photo? I just, I love the photo. I just love the photo and I wanted something that, you know, um, like a beautiful piece of him on my arm. And after going through a few images, this is what I had chosen. In his last conversation with you, he knew he would have known one imagines what he was saying to you and what he really meant. If you could have a conversation with him, and I imagine that in some ways you do in the aftermath, what, what are some of the things you really want him to know about you, the children, the family? Um, I think he knew how much we loved him or how much we love him. Um, I think that was very clear. Um, and I would say it over and over again. Um, I think right now it's just that we miss him a lot. Is there a song in the making? Is there something that is left unfinished, Bianca, that you would like to see finished of Ricky's? Oh, I think there's a lot of, there's going to be a lot of things. Um, um, I think his name and his legacy will just live on with the music, you know, Cotton Fist, Barbershop kids, family, um, but as a family, I think we'll just continue doing, you know, beautiful things around him and, and being able to do it in the most graceful way. If you can, Louisa, just share what these last six months have been like for you without your beloved. Hmm. Well, it has not been um, an easy road. It has been fraught with a lot of difficulty and challenge. Um, it's been fraught with uncertainty. And uh, it also has revealed many, many blessings. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a strange thing that the sense of the pain of him not being here never goes away. It, it just never goes away. And, the, and yet life shows itself to be continuing. So uh, it, it's hard to answer the question. Um, maybe the tr most truthful wording of it would be it's been everything. Mm -hmm. And it continues to just bear everything. I guess the, the, the biggest challenge for me personally is how things just creep on me unexpectedly. I would be in a place that has just nothing to do with anything. And 
and I would just sense a whiff, a smell of something, a thought of something, and, and, and that would just heighten um, Ricardo's presence at that moment. And sometimes that heightening is with a sense of pain and missing and, 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 and I would be caught unawares. But then I would be in another moment where that sense of presence just brings huge joy. Uh, and, and I would pause at that moment and allow myself to feel the joy, the joy of Ricardo having lived life, having been with us, having given me personally so many gifts. That's one of, the, uh, one of the overriding senses you get when you talk about Ricardo, when you talk about Ricky, um, is that he, he loved family. He loved the sense of joy and life wherever he was. There was that kind of vibe in the air, you know, and that kind of beauty really in, in the air. Share with us some, some things about him that the public may not necessarily know. <laughs> these, these quirks and these idiosyncrasies of his. The one thing I... I just used to laugh about is how he used to use words and, and just convert words into a big joke. I mean, one of those examples is in, in, in his music about beans. Just the word is <laughs> It's just beans. And for him, it would be a thing in the kitchen and him and the siblings and the cousins would make a big thing about bonjis and they would break <laughs> they would break out laughing about it so na kolumu bonjis kumi you're smiling and you know you've walked this long journey um with um Maluisa and the family, and Ricky in particular, coming into his life at a very, very young age. And that relationship with him was as fraught as any relationship would be between a father and his son. Just share with us some of, some of those complexities and how you learned from him, and in a way you were able to, to model for him. Well, <coughs> when Louisa and I were comrades in the struggle for a long time, and then when we decided to cross the boundary <laughs> into more than friendship. We had a long discussion about uh, what would happen if it didn't work out and so on. And, and one of the things we talked about very seriously about the boys, you know, we said, well, whatever happens, that so long as the boys want to be part of my life, that would be fine. And that we committed that we would always be friends. And, and Ricky, to be honest, was the one who was the last to fully embrace me. And he came and spent six months with me in Amsterdam. And that, you know, I was really thinking a lot since Ricky passed. That six months was probably one of the most happiest periods in my life, just in the sense of having, because I was very scared about leaving home again and being in a job and so on. And, Ricky kept me anchored for those six months. Um, he had come out of rehab before he came to, and some of my friends were joking, oh, oh why are you taking your boy to Amsterdam? <laughs> given? And I was at full, full confidence in him. When you share that, uh, Kumi, you're also sharing some of the losses, uh, Louisa, that, that Ricky had, had experienced very young in his life, that stayed with him for a long time. Kumi also touched on, you know, his, his own addiction. Um, Bianca touched on his depression at, at, at times. As a mom, how did, how did you deal with those complexities and those struggles that he had? Um, in hindsight, I had an excessive focus on acting on challenge. So I can play back and say for me, the Saturday that Ricardo told me that he was struggling with addiction, I was spiraled into action, such that on Sunday, 
I was already kneeling with my, my mfundisi, praying about it and having a special prayer about it. On Monday, I was already speaking to uh, institutions. On Tuesday, we were already going in. And it was a rolling process. When I now have, in the process of writing about grief, trauma, and healing, I have a huge sense of how I threw everything into the action around Ricardo and addiction. And now I have a huge sense of how strong and wise my other children were around us. Because they were as deeply impacted, they were as deeply in need of attention and focus, they were as deeply uh, committed to support. But I promise you, my analysis of how I deal with encountering what life throws at me is I get into action. And I got into action with regard to Ricardo. Only later on did I open myself up to support and my own therapy about what was going on. It was all about action, 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 until that point where I did open myself up to understanding what is happening. Ricardo was a mighty teacher for me because through that process of going through um, family uh, counseling and support and, and, and learning lessons about how to support um, somebody who is in addiction and going through re rehab, I learned a very important lesson, which is about sitting on my hands. I didn't know how to sit on my hands. It never was an idea in my life. And I'm still struggling with that. I, I don't think I've mastered the lesson of sitting in my hands because sitting in the hands means I must know what is mine to deal with. I must give others opportunity to deal with what is theirs to deal with. I must understand what the elephant in the room is and I must actually engage with it in, at the pace that it needs um, to be engaged with. So as a mother, I continue to, to learn lessons and I continue to operate from the point that my children are key teachers for me. And I don't have it all in a script or in an experience or in any other form. I mean, the thing that I feel the most sad about Ricardo is I feel, I mean, to be honest with you, I don't know, Luisa can say for herself and Bianca, but we were overwhelmed with the amount of love that people showed for him when he passed. We knew that people loved him, but we didn't know on the scale, you know? And that for, for us makes it a bigger tragedy in the sense that he, he didn't only belong to Bianca and our family, he belonged to our people in the love that people showed for him, and he had a lot. I mean, when I spoke to him just over the week, before he passed the last long conversation, I mean, he was so concerned about young people, the future, what's going to happen. And to a lot extent, you know, he never said, I'm worried about Bianca, Mike and Jordan, my family. He always said, I'm worried about what's going to happen to young people in our country, in Africa and so on. Given this, this life and this light and this impact, Louisa, that you 
are hearing Kumi share that you've heard from many people, the impact that he had in his home. As a mother, you know, you often don't expect to have to lay your child to rest. Do you, in some ways, believe that this was unfinished work that Ricky had left? Is there a part of you um, that somehow wills him to still be here and, and, and not, to, not to have concluded his story in the way that he did? Most definitely. I mean, the, the part that longs for a hug always goes there with that, that longing, a deep longing for him to still be walking with us on this side. When Ricardo died for me, it, it literally was for me, it literally, literally was an ending of life. I, I, I was walking, I was here, but I really didn't know anything. I just, it felt like I know nothing. I, I had to, you know, just make sense of things, try and make sense of things. And that's the process even today. It is for me a sense-making uh, process every Breathing day is a sense-making process. And I am holding on to things that seem to be guiding beams about what it means to be in life. And, 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 and when I look at the effects of Ricardo's life, there is something in me that is now watching me easily release and say, truly, truly, Ricardo, I don't know the full story, but yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for living this life. You lived this life. Thank you. I think all of us have our moments of pain and desperation right now, but uh, I hope is that Louisa will know that Bianca, the boys and myself and the kids as well, mm. you know, we are okay if she needs to be sad. Mm. And what do you say to that? I do appreciate it and I also appreciate that I am, I'm learning to to let go of the guard that um, my life story caused me to put up. And so I must say that with um, Ricardo's passing, even though I may not show it all the time, I do crumble. It's so nice of you guys to join us um, on a cold night, but it's very warm inside. And there's such a beautiful sort of atmosphere of warmth on this, in this moment, really, where we mark the six month anniversary of Ricky's passing. What for you are some of the lessons that you learned from him? Um, there are so many lessons I learned from him. And I don't know, he was such a polarizing like character like the way you described him. He had such a lust for life and he was always spontaneous and he always was on the go. So I think that's one of the biggest lessons. Like he always told me, like, you have to keep on moving. Like you have to keep on going, no matter what, like you're down, you're out, you're tired. No matter what it is, you have to keep on operating. And I think that's one of the biggest lessons that he taught me, that you have to keep on operating. And that's something that's stuck with me and become a big phrase yeah. in my life and actually everyone around in the whole of South Africa, you know, let's operate, let's move. So that's one thing that sticks up. Uh, Shekhani, you know, as, a, as the older brother, how did, how did you, are you at a place of acceptance with, with what has happened? Um, you, well, I'm a bit different. Um, what is a place of acceptance? You could never get to a place of acceptance, what we do is we swim through, we flow, 
We go through it. We, we're going through it for the rest of our lives. It's all about how we live through it. So there can never be acceptance um, of what has happened because it's always going to be sad. And, but the lower, we will flow through it. We will we'll embrace it. We embody it. We become part of this new life or this new way of swimming through this ocean called Earth, you know? So, um, with, especially with the music everywhere, reminders everywhere, how do you accept, you know? What you do is embrace, yeah. You know, as I have this conversation with you, first of all, so mindful of the rawness of this moment, um, and that it's not about time passing. It is about how you connect with what was and, and how you bring that into your, into your everyday. Just, you know, still feeling that kind of heaviness on the one hand, but also such a, a sense of light at how stoic you are in almost coming to places of peace with what has happened. Um, I imagine in Tobacco it's going to be a, life, a lifelong journey yeah. of missing, of longing. Yeah, it will be. I think it's exactly how Shabani put it. It's never really a getting over it. It's you know how we live through it and what we do next. And it's always going to be here. It's always going to be present. It's it's a daily reminder. You know, as Mom said earlier, you can walk around, you hear the music, you smell something. It's always going to be present. And it's just how do we continue? How do we continue to move, to be to live on, holding the memory and not continuing to mourn? You know, just you hold it tight. Louisa, there's so much to preserve about Ricky's life and his contribution to art and fashion and music. What is the family doing to make sure that that is a repository for not only his children, but for young people who he specifically had such a heart for? Yeah, we, we're at a place where it is clear that we have to build on what he loved. We have to build on what really moved him. And so the Ricky Rick Foundation for the promotion of artivism is the vehicle uh, to do that. And artivism is the place where arts and culture meets with activism. And that's where the love is worked on, is generated. The young people are supported through that. That's where love causes us to pay attention to well-being and mental health and to connect those who are working in this space and support efforts and help young people to really, really see themselves shining. Um, I've got a, a little prayer corner in our room and I use that space to you know, to talk to him. And sometimes I just talk, you know. It's like it almost feels at times that he is around. And not that he, it's, it feels that way, I think it is that way. Um, and also just listening to music, um, watching videos, talking to siblings, talking to the friends um, about him and memories and, um, yeah, I think that's, that's what I do when I miss him, but I do do a lot of talking. <laughs>